Uh, Mr. Casa decided maybe we shouldn't make this presentation until after the speech, but we have great confidence in the speech, so we'll go ahead. Uh, if you'd like to join me up here. We, uh, we uh, have a tradition at the Wheatley Institution for our distinguished uh, lecturers in international affairs to present them with this uh, Navajo sand painting oh, wow. that's been specially made uh, for this purpose. Now, you can probably just stick this in your carry-on yeah, and, sure. and get, back, uh, <laughs> get back to Hawaii. Uh, we will ship it for you. We're good oh, at terrific, that. Terrific, terrific. Now, we, we also have, which we'll include with it, a... Uh, the artist's own explanation of what the meaning of the painting is. This was Great. done by a local artist here in Provo, and we wanted you to have this as a memento of your, of your trip here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll keep this that puts the pressure on here now. <laughs> um, We'll turn the time now to uh, General Jordan, who will do two things. He will talk just for a few minutes about the purpose and the, f and the form of this conference, uh, and then he will uh, give the formal introduction to this evening's keynote speaker, Ralph Casa. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak to you at the onset of WIAC 1, WIAC being the Wheatley International Affairs Conference, the first one of which we, we anticipate there will be many more in the future. Our numbers are a bit fewer than we had anticipated, and uh, fortunately, uh, uh, we make up in quality what we lack in quantity. And I'm sure you'll have a, a very fruitful morning and afternoon, Wednesday and Thursday, uh, roundtable discussions. And uh, Thursday, uh, you're also going to be having a, a trip up into the mountains for a karaoke party. <laughs> Friday morning, we'll have another final session in which each roundtable will present the findings of their analysis of the particular country that they've been uh, discussing and what American policy should be toward that country. And so we expect uh, some uh, innovative ideas that can be forwarded directly to the National Security Council. In any case, uh, this is our first venture and we're pleased to have the uh, group of roundtable participants that we have. You know, the idea is that through an interchange, a focused interchange, on each of the key countries in uh, Asia, that we can develop an overall view, a, a, a comprehensive view, of what American policy in Asia should be. And we're especially pleased tonight to have Ralph Casa talk to us about an American perspective on the rise of Asia. As you know, the theme of the conference is the rise of Asia. He's had an extraordinary career, which has been summarized in that little flyer that you have uh, with the materials we gave you. As you will see, he has a, an extraordinary range of things that he brings uh, to us in the way of uh, expertise. He's Deputy Director of the National Defense University's uh, Strategic Studies Center. He's a Fellow on National Security Affairs at the Hoover Institution, a board member of the Korean-U.S. Relations, Security Relations uh, Group, a, a member, a board member of the uh, uh, let's see, it would be the it'd be the U.S.-China Relations Committee. Yes, he's also 
involved in the International Strategic Studies Institute in London and the ASEAN Regional Forum. I'll say a little bit more about the ASEAN Regional Forum, or ARF as we call it, because it is a most promising organization which uh, Ralph is playing a very prominent role in. He has, in addition to his formal education and uh, membership in these various organizations that I talked about, he has uh, an expertise in our topic of tonight, 30 years, as a matter of fact, of, of uh, wrestling these problems, and he uh, explicates his views periodically in the publications of uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Pacific Forum, but also he writes a regular column for the Japan, Japan Times and the Korea Times. His uh, current position as head of the Pacific Forum is uh, what he spends well over half a year uh, serving. Uh, I think he said it was 220 some days that he was uh, on the road last year. But one of those relationships I take particular pride in because as Ralph's predecessor, I had a role in establishing the Council on Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific, which is a dialogue group of 21 of the countries in East Asia and Canada and the United States. And it affords an opportunity for the views of the individual countries to be if you will, disseminated, articulated, and uh, perhaps adjusted uh, as the uh, dialogues proceed. CSCAP, I think, has an enormous promise for the future. One of the more important roles that CSCAP plays is that it provides the staff arm for the, for the ARF, the Asian ASEAN Regional Forum. Now that's un unusual that a, that a track two, you know, we talk in uh, international politics about track one institutions, which are governmental institutions, and then track two, which are non-governmental institutions, which of course CSCAP is, and uh, the Pacific Forum is, and the Wheatley Institution <laughs> is, et cetera. But uh, CSCAP, role as a staff arm of ARF is the first time I think that a track two institution has been entrusted to do the staff work to set the priorities and the agenda for a track one institution. That's how important CSCAP's role is. We have the ASEAN Regional Forum of 27 of the countries in East and South Asia that uh, works essentially on uh, foreign policy and defense policy issues in the region and has a direct impact as a track two institution, I mean, I'm sorry, as a track one institution on the respective governments of those countries in their developing their policies on, on the other uh, ARF uh, countries. So that's a key role that uh, Ralph plays, but only one of the many hats he wears. And I'm so pleased to be able to introduce to you uh, an extraordinary man, Dr. Ralph Casa. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Joe. Aloha, everyone, as we say in, in Hawaii. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be able to uh, talk with you this evening. I'm really the warm-up act for tomorrow's real keynote address, which is President Ramos, who's 
one of my personal heroes, and I'm just so delighted to be able to share a, a platform with him. I, I want to sort of give you a broad overview of just my own personal perspective. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm used to talking to other old people. So I, it was a little intimidating actually talking to, to, uh, to a younger audience. So I was racking my brain. I was trying to remember what, what I learned in college or what you know, professors in college told me. And I, the best I could come up with was a philosophy professor that I had when I was an undergraduate who to try to get us to you know, be serious and think profound thoughts would say, a man becomes what he thinks about most. And I thought about that, and I said, if that was true, if a man really became what he thought about most, by the time I was 20, I would have been a girl. So, <laughs> so I figured that really wasn't probably the advice I, I needed to give you. And instead, what I, what I thought I would do is you're going to hear in the next couple of days a lot of facts. And, and the facts about Asia are important. It's a third of the world's economy. It's, it's a, a third of US trade. Uh, the second and third largest economies in the world, China and Japan, or Japan and China, depending on whose numbers you believe uh, are, are in Asia. Uh, it's vitally important to the United States. And, and you'll, you probably have already done some homework, and you've done some work on that. Uh, and you'll hear a lot more about it. So what I thought I would try to do tonight, and to also leave some time for, for Q&A, is to talk instead about some trends. I think five major trends that I see coming in Asia right now from a US perspective. And then uh, we'll get the Asian perspective tomorrow night. And, and President Ramos can correct all of my mistakes and tell us what's, what's really going on. But I wanted to sort of focus on uh, what I think the Obama administration has been trying to do correctly uh, in Asia. I would also point out that, that our think tank is a, is a nonpartisan group. Uh, we actually noted during the campaign uh, that when it came to Asia policy, it seemed like candidate Obama was running on President Bush's Asia policy while candidate McCain was running against it. Uh, and uh, I think that's because we had a pretty good foundation of, of US policy in Asia. Uh, because of that, when the new administration came in, uh, they didn't have to dig themselves out of the hole uh, that previous administrations had dug themselves in in Asia. We didn't have the strategic competitor China or the butchers of Beijing China. We had a good relationship with China already beginning. We already had a good interaction and enhanced partnership with ASEAN. We had solid alliances. So the Obama administration was able to build on that in, in Asia. And what I want to talk about is, is five broad trends. And I'll, I'll try to do this uh, uh, quickly so that we can leave some time for, for Q&A. But the first trend uh, is the growing importance of Southeast Asia. Uh, when people think Asia, they think China, they think Japan, they think North Korea, if you've been watching the TV and seeing the pomp and circumstance going on there. But really, there's uh, a half, a half a billion people in Southeast Asia uh, that are of growing importance, the fourth largest trading partner of the United States. Uh, and an area that, is, that has really been booming and that the US is paying more and more attention to. Uh, we have an advantage in that uh, many Southeast Asians see President Obama as a, quote, native son because he had spent some time in his youth uh, in Indonesia. So there was sort of a, already, I think, an opening. But as I mentioned, there was also a very solid foundation of US interaction with ASEAN. ASEAN is the 10 Southeast Asian countries, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations that, that are linked together for political and economic reasons. And we've seen uh, just last week in New York, President Obama meeting uh, with the heads of government of, of the 10 countries. Actually, there were eight out of 10 uh, heads of government there. Uh, the ninth, uh, Burma, by mutual agreement, the head does not come so that it doesn't turn into a contest between the US and the Burmese. And the 10th was President Yudhoyono from uh, Indonesia, who had essentially, President Obama had promised to visit three times in the last year and still hasn't made it there. And it would have been sort of politically awkward, I think, for him to come to New York until Obama finally gets there, which he will be doing next month. Uh, but again, a very important message, uh, an important meeting. 
uh, decision to move the relationship to a strategic partnership, uh, something that many Southeast Asians wouldn't have even mentioned uh, five years ago, much less been willing to put it into a, a joint statement. That's the good news, a trend of much deeper cooperation between the U.S. and ASEAN. The bad news, the challenge to that, uh, is the one country that I mentioned earlier, Burma, Myanmar, as it's called in, in Southeast Asia. They are in the process of having a, quote, free and fair election, uh, which will not be either free nor fair. Uh, no one uh, expects that. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was, they rewrote a constitution to keep her from uh, being eligible uh, to run. Uh, I had the great pleasure of meeting her a number of years ago and spending four hours with her. Uh, just an incredible person, uh, but obviously seen as a great threat to, uh, to the leadership there. So I think that this is going to put a natural break. Uh, and the big challenge for the U.S. and ASEAN, and for those of you talking about Southeast Asia in the next couple of days, is how do we get over this hump? Uh, the, the Obama administration tried to reach out a hand uh, to, the, to the leaders in Burma. We've had a little bit uh, better interaction, but it's still not going very far. The second trend uh, builds on something that uh, General Jordan mentioned a few minutes ago, and that's the ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, the ARF has been what many people have called a, quote, talk shop. Uh, 27 countries uh, as diverse as Bangladesh on the one side and uh, Japan on the other, uh, driven by ASEAN, ASEAN in the, quote, driver's seat we sometimes wonder how 10, 10 people can steer in the same direction, particularly when sometimes you have three on the accelerator and seven on the brakes. Uh, but there has been, I think, in the last couple of years, some forward movement with the ARF. Uh, and, and what we're seeing is, I think, a renewed U.S. commitment uh, to the ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, Secretary Clinton uh, has been to two meetings now, has committed uh, to continue uh, going to these meetings. We've seen them doing things, and again, the Philippines was a leader in this last year, the first humanitarian assistance and disaster relief exercise. This wasn't just people talking. This was people sending ships and planes to practice together on how to help people in time of need. Uh, a great step forward uh, in, in this region. Uh, that's, again, the good news, the positive trend. We're moving forward uh, with the ARF. Uh, the problem is that there is a commitment within the ARF, first of all, for ASEAN to drive. And sometimes there's good drivers, and sometimes there's not so good drivers. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the ARF is a consensus organization, which will go at a speed comfortable to all. Now, there's two ways you can interpret that phrase. Comfortable to all should mean that it goes a little too slow for some and a little too fast for others. What it has turned out in reality is it goes so slow that even the slowest feels comfortable. Uh, and the ASEAN is going to have to get over that. The ARF is going to have to get over that and try to move at a speed that some countries like the US, Australia, and others will still be frustrated that it's going too slow, uh, but that others will finally feel like it's moving a little faster than, than their comfort zone. So that, to me, is the real challenge for uh, multilateralism right now is how do you move the ARF forward, and then how do you meld it with the new organization, the East Asia Summit, uh, which involves many of the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum countries, but not the ones from South Asia other than India. This is going to be, I think, the key forum uh, for at least political and economic cooperation in the coming years. Uh, Secretary Clinton is going to this year's meeting in order to accept formal U.S. Uh, membership in the EAS, and starting next year, President Obama will or should or hopefully will uh, start going to these meetings. So this is going to be the challenge to how do we then sort of move this, this process forward. The next major trend that I want to throw out for you uh, is actually a global trend, uh, but it has particular resonance in East Asia. And that's the effort uh, by the Obama administration, again, uh, by the US, but certainly by others, uh, to move toward a nuclear-free world, the issue of nonproliferation and disarmament. For many years, the US tried to convince the countries of East Asia to, to get on board the disarmament train uh, without understanding that disarmament 
and, I mean, non-proliferation train. But non-proliferation and disarmament are two sides of the same coin. And if there's a perception in the rest of the world that the U.S. isn't serious about denuclearization, then the rest of the world is not going to be overly serious about helping us in the area that we consider most important, uh, which is non-proliferation. Uh, some countries like Japan, which have concerns about proliferation, are on board regardless. Uh, but others, you have to sort of convince them uh, that you're willing to look at both sides of, of the coin. That's being done now. I think we're moving forward in the right direction. But of course, that's the good news. What's the bad news? Well, the bad news, if you've been turning on your TV lately, you've seen the goose-stepping young women from North Korea marching down the marching down the aisle, and you've seen the North Koreans claiming that they would love to sit down with their fellow nuclear weapon states and talk about uh, disarmament. How do we handle that? How do we handle North Korea? Uh, how do we handle North Korea when, in particular, uh, they have a new defense attorney? Uh, their defense attorney is China. Uh, and the Chinese have been, in the last year or so, been sort of bending over backwards to protect the North Koreans I'll talk a little bit about why I think that that is in a moment. Uh, but the key issue is uh, you can't get from five or seven or eight to zero by adding more nuclear weapon states. And I think the US position, previous administrations and this administration, is that you have to work on the nonproliferation aspect. You have to also prevent new countries from joining the nuclear club, and you can't recognize those who have sort of put themselves in it uh, unilaterally. So how do we deal with North Korea is going to be, I think, one of the great challenges. The U.S. Uh, approach has been, quote, strategic patience. Uh, that's been driven, I think, by a belief that the North Koreans were not about to give up their nuclear weapons anyway, so why should we sit down and have a dialogue with them where we could pay them a third or fourth time to do the same things they've done before, only to walk away at the end. The one problem that we've discovered with North Korea is that they don't mind being called names. They don't mind being considered the outcasts of the world. What they really hate is to be ignored. Uh, and if you try to ignore them and, and isolate them, then they do little nasty things like sinking, attacking uh, South Korean uh, ships or, or creating uh, mayhem in the DMZ. Uh, so that's going to be, I think, one of the real security challenges is how do you gain momentum in denuclearization when you've got new members who want to join the club? And of course, it's not just North Korea, it's also Iran. Uh, I am not familiar enough with what's happening in the Middle East to talk intelligently about that, but obviously North Korea is only, only part of the problem. We have to deal with the Iranians as well. That brings to the fourth big trend in Asia. Uh, most people, when you hear the term, the rise of, uh, the next word is not Asia, it's China. Uh, because a lot of people are concerned about the rise of China. What does it mean? Uh, where is it going? Where are U.S.-China relations heading? In my own view, uh, when the Obama administration came into power, it believed that it could take U.S.-China relations to the next level, the next higher level. Remember I said... We didn't start in a hole like the previous administrations. Uh, the Obama administration agreed to having a strategic dialogue with China at the Secretary of State, State Counselor level. What we've discovered, I think, in the last year is that the Chinese very much wanted to have something called a strategic dialogue because they kind of like that term and it makes them sound like they're one of the big kids. But they really weren't prepared to have a strategic dialogue as we defined it. When we said strategic dialogue, it meant let's sit down and talk about Sudan, and let's sit down and talk about Iran, and let's sit down and talk about uh, Africa and, and some of the tyrants in those areas, and let's sit down and really do something about North Korea. Uh, the Chinese said, well, not so fast. We still don't really want to interfere in uh, internal affairs of other countries. Uh, and quite frankly, when you look at some of the worst tyrants around the world, uh, the one thing they all have in common is that their best friend seems to be China. Now, I'm, I'm not of the school that says we need to bash China, we need to contain China, we need to interact with China. I think the, the U.S., Japan, other countries uh, 20, 30 years ago made the right decision. We said 
We've seen rising powers in Europe. Uh, Germany in the 20th century rose three times. First two times, it was pretty ugly. Third time, it worked out pretty well. What was the difference? The third time, they brought Germany in. They helped Germany to rise, but it was an integrated Germany. Now, we also had the Soviet Union as the outside threat. That certainly helped, but, but the philosophy was you want to create an interactive, interdependent society, and that was the decision that the US and Japan and others made, ASEAN made regarding China. Let's give them a vested interest in this. Let's bring them inside the tent. Let's work with the Chinese and help China rise. The reality is China wouldn't have the second or third largest economy in the world today if it hadn't been for US and Japanese direct foreign investment and, uh, and assistance, developmental aid. And the reason that we did that was not because we suddenly had a guilty complex or just loved the Chinese. It was because we wanted to create an interdependent world where the, when China rose, it would have a vested interest in the system as, as we see it. So far, the good news is China is essentially behaving. The bad news is China hasn't quite fully risen yet. And what we've seen uh, is Chinese in the last year or so muscle flexing. Uh, we've also seen them continuing to support and defend and, and, and to, in some respects, empower North Korea. Uh, this, to me, is one of our biggest concerns in Asia because the only way we can get North Korea to behave, quote unquote, to denuclearize, to become part of the international system of nations, is if the countries that are dealing with them, and particularly the countries of Northeast Asia, all speak with one voice. Uh, and we had that for a while after the North Koreans detonated their second nuclear test because the Chinese had told them not to do it and they did it. Uh, and the Chinese sort of got on board with us and we were all jointly pressuring the North Koreans. Uh, that's no longer the case. Uh, part of this deals with, I'm, I hope most of you are familiar, or you should become in the next few days with the Chunan incident, which was a South Korean uh, ship that was attacked uh, by a North Korean submarine. The North Koreans have denied they've done it, uh, but there was an international investigation that pretty conclusively showed that it was a submarine attack, uh, and the only logical person to have done it, given the types of weapons involved, et cetera, et cetera, was the North Koreans. Uh, the Chinese have defended the North Koreans at the United Nations. They watered down uh, the, the protests there. Uh, I think there's a couple of reasons for this. One, uh, the Chinese put the biggest emphasis on stability. Uh, secondly, from a US perspective, from a South Korean perspective, the attack on this ship was a violation of the armistice. It was an action at least as serious as conducting a nuclear test or a missile launch. From a Chinese perspective, this was the North and South shooting up one another. This is still down there. It's not up in the threshold where the Chinese get upset and, and react. So part of this has just been a different perspective between the Chinese and the US and South Korea on how egregious this last North Korean action was. The last thing, that when I've, I've been in to China five times in the last six months, and when I talk with the Chinese, there are two things that are very interesting. One is that you'll hear very strong debates within the various think tanks and even within the ministries in China over whether or not China's policy toward North Korea makes sense. Uh, there are serious debates in China over whether or not they are protecting North Korea to the extent that they're undermining their relations with the South and with, and with others. So there's, there's at least thinking in China that, that that has to change. But the more important view that seems to come across is that North Korea will not change until Kim Jong-il dies, but the odds are he's going to die pretty soon. Uh, no one knows exactly when, but he's had several strokes, and if you believe all the medical reports, it's amazing that the guy is, is still alive, but ultimately he's now grooming his 27 or 28 or 29-year-old son. Uh, no one's not even sure how old he is uh, to replace him, but with his uncle as sort of the regent. Well, the Chinese know the uncle well and seem to believe that the uncle will lead North Korea down a path of, quote, Chinese-style reform. Uh, and from a Chinese perspective, that's good enough to sort of 
keep things quiet and just sort of hope for the best. Uh, it would certainly support US interest to see North Korea moving down the quote Chinese style reform. It would certainly help the North Korean people in the long run. But that won't help at all in denuclearizing North Korea. It won't help in improving human rights in North Korea. It won't help in all the other egregious things that North Koreans do. And you don't get to be the regent or the heir apparent in North Korea by being sort of a kind, gentle, fuzzy person. Uh, these guys are, are, are a pretty ruthless lot. So this is, I think, what we still have to deal with. So there's sort of the real challenge in uh, where are we going with China? Uh, how can we get over these fundamental disagreements uh, with the Chinese on the issues like North Korea, Burma is another place where the Chinese have been protecting them, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, I think, some of the challenges in managing the rise of China, managing the US-China relationship. The good news is that both sides are much more realistic today than they were uh, 18 months ago. Uh, I think the Obama administration has understood there's a limit to how close they can become with China. I think the Chinese are now understanding there's a limit to how much they can push uh, the U.S. before we start pushing back. Uh, and we are now starting to push back at the ARF and other places to remind the Chinese that they've gone a little too far in a lot of their, their statements. Uh, we're sending carriers into the Yellow Sea just to remind them that international waters means international waters. Uh, and, and I think we've seen that the Chinese defense minister in Hanoi in the last couple of days sort of toning his remarks down a little bit. And so we'll see where, we'll see where all of this goes. But there is, of course, a fundamental difference between the US and China in our worldviews, in our views of international responsibility, uh, and in how to pursue that. So this is, it's not going to be easy, but it's important uh, we don't want to see China 10 years from now being the Germany of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and that's what we ha always have to keep in the back of our mind as we look at our relations, is how do we sort of promote the positive? Now, what's the real good news? Uh, this is sort of a little self-serving, uh, self-promotion here. We at Pacific Forum in Honolulu run a Young Leaders Program. I'm going to do some preliminary recruiting uh, here among you. This is for young people in their age, ages 22 to 32, uh, graduate students, PhD students, young professionals in their first job after college. You've got a few years yet to, to sort of work on this. And we take these young people and we bring them to our senior level conferences all over the world. They'll be with us in Bangkok next week, in Ho Chi Minh City in December, in Edinburgh, Scotland uh, in November. Uh, and they sit in with the senior level dialogues and then meet themselves and sort of tell the old folks just how screwed up we really are and what the real answers are. We've got over 300 kids from 26 different countries who are part of this program. The most amazing are some of the young Chinese. And, and I'll, I'll tell you a, a little anecdote. Understanding that the plural of anecdote is not fact. Uh, you know, a lot of anecdotes just mean a lot of stories. but they add up and I think they reflect. We had a young Chinese woman who was a fellow with us at Pacific Forum for six months. She was a graduate of the Foreign Affairs University, both a bachelor and a master's degree, Foreign Affairs University, being groomed for foreign ministry positions. She received a scholarship to work on her PhD at American University uh, in, in Washington. Her advisor uh, in China said, don't do it. Uh, if you want a career in the Chinese Foreign Service, you do not want to have an American PhD. This will be held against you. This will hold you back. She thought about it for a few minutes, sort of slept on it. And the next day, she called her advisor, and she said, I hope by the time I get my PhD from American University, China has outgrown this kind of foolish thinking and, and moved on. This is sort of the hope, uh, in, in my view, in China. Uh, when I'm in China, I sometimes have trouble getting on my website, because occasionally the CSIS website is blocked. All I have to do is turn to any 25-year-old in China and say, how can I do this? And they go, tsh, tsh, boom, use this, use that, and boom, you're back on. They've, they've avoided all of these blocks. So the Chinese government is kidding itself when it thinks that it can 
keep people from knowing that a dissident in China just won the Nobel Peace Prize for standing up for the young people in Tiananmen Square. Uh, this, is, this is delusional. So while the Chinese keep worrying about the American threat and the US-Japan threat and everything else, the real Chet threat in China is the rising expectations of their 25-year-olds who have never known anything but the pie getting bigger every year and them sort of living up to those expectations. And that's the challenge, and to me, that's the, that's the real hope as we go forward. The final trend, if, if you will, which is right now not a trend, is cooperation in Northeast Asia. Uh, while we've had ASEAN for years of bringing Southeast Asia together, and we've got the ARF bringing sort of the Asia-Pacific community together, when you look at Northeast Asia, China, Japan, South Korea, North Korea, plus the US likes to put ourselves in that pot, Canada, Mongolia, a few others, uh, there's really been no organized level of cooperation. The six party talks that were brought together to deal with, with the North Korean threat are about the only example of Northeast Asia regional cooperation, but it's an ad hoc functional as opposed to a broader cooperative like, like ASEAN or, or the ARF. Uh, from a U.S. perspective, the key to stability in Northeast Asia is not everyone sitting together and holding hands and singing Kumbaya. The, the key to stability is the U.S.-Japan alliance, the U.S.-Korea alliance, and working in a three-way coordination among those three to try to promote stability while Japan, China, and Korea cooperate in the economic realm, uh, and you have other types of little minilateral coordinations. But the real challenge, again, as you're, as you're looking at, at, at all of these things, is how do you keep, sustain, validate a bilateral alliance structure which has maintained peace and stability in East Asia over the past 50, 60 years, while still trying to create some type of a mechanism to bring the North Koreans in, uh, to get the Chinese to be more part of the solution than part of the problem, and to also keep the Koreans, the South Koreans, and the Japanese on the same sheet of music cooperating with one another. That is sort of the challenge. Uh, I think in the last year or so, we've seen very good cooperation between Korea and Japan. And that's moved things in the right direction. So to me, those are sort of the, the big trends uh, that you need to be watching for and talking about as you talk about the rise of Asia, why it's important, and, and what kind of policies the US uh, should be pursuing uh, to deal with it. I have think I've exceeded or just about hit my, my 25 minutes. So Richard, why don't, if you don't mind, I'll stop here and just open it up for Q&A, and we can talk. Yeah, please, uh, so that your colleagues and all can hear you. Uh, if you'll come on up to the mic to ask your question, uh, and then uh, I'll try to make up an answer or, or uh, delay until tomorrow and let President Ramos answer it. Please, questions. Yes, please. Yeah, if there are other questions, just sort of come up and start a queue, and then this way we won't waste a lot of time waiting. Please, but if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to let us know where you're from. Yeah, no problem. My name is David Kramer. I go here at BYU. I'm studying economics and Asian studies. Um, you mentioned how Burma could be a, a hindrance in the U.S. Asia ASEAN relationship. Um, how do you think the United States could better engage with ASEAN despite that problem? Is my question. Okay. Well, uh, I think there are a number of ways. Some of some that we're we're already doing. The fact that, uh, and this again, uh, to to underscore the bipartisan nature. Uh, President Bush, several years ago, tried to have the first U.S. ASEAN summit. Uh, and at that point, an agreement was reached, essentially, that the head of Burma would not show up at the summit, that you know, he'd send someone junior, and that would provide us the face necessary to do that. So we've, we've already demonstrated an ability to, to compromise in, in some areas. Uh, the next thing that the Obama administration did when it came in was to say, and, and Secretary Clinton said this, I think, very bluntly, U.S. policy toward Burma has not worked. But before ASEAN starts patting itself on the back, ASEAN policy toward Burma also has not worked. You know, we, they've said hug them, we've said condemn them, and they've continued to go on being exactly the way they are. So we, obviously we've got to come 
to some sort of a happy medium, what can that be? The US had to take the first step, and I think we did. And, and Secretary Campbell, Assistant Secretary of State Kurt Campbell, has been uh, to Burma a couple of times now. We've, we've sort of tried to open up. Uh, but the key right now is going to be, in, in my view, and, and I'm sure President Ramos may have, have different views, but to me, the real key is going to be how ASEAN responds to what is obviously going to be a fraudulent election. Uh, the, the Burmese, there are some areas that are not even allowing people to vote. They've excluded whole categories from folks. National League for Democracy is boycotting it, uh, and the Constitution was written in a way that keeps a lot of people from voting. So where do we go from here? Can we reach some sort of a happy medium? I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on ASEAN to want to say, well, free and fair enough. You know, it's a good first step, and you know, let's hug and make up and, and try to move forward. That's politically untenable uh, for the United States, for Australia, for, uh, for many other countries. So what we're going to have to do is watch some of the democracies uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, I'll tell you sort of a, an interesting story since no one else has come up, so I'm going to drag this question out until someone comes up to ask the second question. Uh, when I met in 2002 with Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, she was very upset with two countries in Southeast Asia, the Philippines and Indonesia. Uh, and the reason was because she had been released from house arrest about three months earlier. Uh, the Thais, the Malaysians, the Singaporeans had sent their ambassadors to meet with her. Uh, but Philippines and Indonesia had not done so yet. And they were both countries at the time that had women presidents. And she was very mad. She said, please send a message to those two women, letting them know how mad I am, which I did, you know, I mean, through third parties, using Joe Almonte in, in, in the Philippines. Uh, and lo and behold, they then, you know, went and did that. Uh, the democracies in Southeast Asia, I mean, the, the big difference between then and now is that you have a vibrant democracy in Indonesia that's trying to push human rights uh, within ASEAN, the, the, uh, the new political economic community in, in ASEAN. So uh, we need to be flexible. We need to not be the way Americans normally are, and pushy and arrogant in this area. Uh, but we also need to hear the democracies in in Southeast Asia speaking up, in particular Indonesia, since it's the big kid on, uh, on that block. And that, to me, is, is the way forward. Right? Thank you very much. Sure. Yes, ma'am. My name is Karen Bennett. I'm a, I uh, have a degree in international relations. Right. No, no karaoke now. When people grab a <laughs> mic like that in Asia, it uh, normally means trouble. I'm going to channel Oprah okay. here. Right. Um, no, I have a degree in international relations from BYU and a master's in public administration. And my husband, Bruce Bennett, is one of the presenters for this conference. Yeah, I, I know Bruce very well. And Bruce. I believe you and I have met before in a way. I think we have. Yeah. Um, uh, my question relates to your comment about the uh, kind of some kind of continuing um, organization more in Northeast Asia. I think that historically, because of the aggressiveness of Japan and um, its occupation of Korea and uh, hostilities in China, that um, I, I think the the history does not speak to this coming forth. It seems it still seems very fresh from what um, I know about the region, which mm -hmm. is not anywhere near to what you know. Do you still see it having um, their history, having an impact that will prevent this, or do you see hearts softening and them moving closer together? Th thank you. I, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And again, I, I revert back to our, our Young Leaders Program. Uh, when I hold, and I've for, for 15 years now, I've been holding trilateral U.S., Japan, China meetings. Uh, and it's, they sort of go up and down, but invariably at some point uh, in, in the meeting, the Chinese are going to bring up history, and they're going to start complaining about what the Japanese did, you know, in, in World War II and, and all of that. And, and the Japanese response is, oh, so, 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 so sorry. And they, you know, how, how far down can you bend and, you know, and all of this. Uh, the young leaders in the room say, cut this crap out. 
You know, I'm not going to apologize for what my great-grandfather did. This is history. We've given you billions of dollars of aid, and you haven't even said thank you. You know, maybe we should stop investing in China. Maybe we should start putting our money in Vietnam instead. And the Chinese go, whoa, whoops, wait a second. This tactic isn't working anymore. Because in most respects, it's, it's a tactic uh, more than it is anything else. Same thing in Korea. I, I have the utmost of respect for Im Young Bak, the president of Korea. And one of the main reasons why is his predecessors, even Nobel laureate Kim Dae-jung, when their popularity got down to 30%, well, they, the best way to do it is you sort of drum up Dakto, Dakashima, the contested islands, or you do something to say something nasty about the Japanese, and your popularity immediately goes up. And Yan Bak said, I'm not going to play this game. Uh, we need to improve uh, Japan-Korea relations. And as a result, we're seeing things moving in that direction. Look, let's face it. No one in Europe liked the Germans for a long time either. Uh, they had to get along with the Germans because they had the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain there staring them in the face. So that sort of pu pushed the process a little bit quicker. But, you know, I mean, we used to have a gripe with the Brits. Remember they came and burned down the White House and all that kind of stuff? You know, people have forgotten. I mean, it, you know, the nice thing about history is that at some point it becomes history. Uh, the Chinese government has seen it's in its national interest to play this history card over and over and over again. And they'll continue to do that as long as it works. But it's not working that well anymore, because now the Japanese are starting to speak up a little bit more and having a little bit more backbone in this area. And the next generation, as I say, is not tolerant of this. Uh, and once that happens, then I think you finally get, get beyond the history. And I think the same thing is happening in, in Korea. Uh, are they going to you know, be loving one another you know, like, you know, Americans and Canadians or something? No, but, you know, uh, uh, but I think things are moving in, in the right direction, and I, I would say that it's becoming less and less, of a, less and less of a problem. What it requires at the end of the day is inspired leadership, strong leadership, leaders who understand the importance of the good relations and, and push that forward. And we've had that in Korea. Uh, I give uh, Mr. Khan credit in, uh, in Japan trying to move that in the right direction. The previous three or four Japanese prime ministers have all been very solid in trying to move things in that direction. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, despite history. Thank you. Sure. Next question. Uh, my name is Doug Choi, uh, majoring in international relations from South Korea. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, like as you might agree, that North Korea has been a, has provided a lot of advantages to China, such as um, it functioning as a buffer zone, and it also uh, has been a great reason for China to get involved in Korean pen Peninsula. But at the same time, recently North Korea has been uh, um, quite an embarrassment to China as well, such as recent China incident right. and also a succession of dictatorship from father to son. And I would like to ask, um, what is your anticipa uh, anticipation of the future relationship between North Korea and China um, as China is moving on, is trying to advance itself onto a global level? Like, how do you see the relationship will change in the long term? Yeah. Well, uh, it's, it's a wonderful question. As I sort of alluded to earlier, I think the Chinese uh, believe that whoever replaces Kim Jong-il is going to be a little bit more agreeable, acceptable to China. And the Chinese have always seen sort of having a North Korean state there as, as useful as a buffer zone. Uh, at the end of the day, the question that many Chinese are now debating is, can you have stability in Northeast Asia with a North Korea that thinks it can get away with things because it now has us deterred because of its, of its nuclear weapons? So if the Chinese ultimate goal is stability, uh, Will the area be more stable if North Korea went away? Uh, I think the Chinese understand, like everyone else understands, that North Korea has lost. The game is over. Uh, the question is, how do you get them to peacefully die in their sleep uh, so that you don't have a war, you don't, you know, that the, you know, the DMZ crumbles like the Berlin Wall crumbled and, 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 and you have a happy ending there. 
I think if anyone can come up with a good formula for having that happen, even the Chinese would sign up to it today because they're fed up enough with, with the North Koreans. Uh, they may need some assurances about US bases in the North, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is I have never met a Chinese who trusted the North Koreans. Uh, and in our CSCAP process, we have North Koreans participate all the time. And I have never met a North Korean who trusted the Chinese. This is the ultimate marriage of convenience where both are sleeping with one eye open. Uh, they, you know, there's, no, there's no trust on either side, uh, but nobody quite knows how do you get from here to a unified, peaceful Korean peninsula. Uh, there have been formulas in the past, the Confederation, the Federation. Uh, uh, that was one of Kim Dae-jung's ideas and even Kim Il-sung talking about you know, some way of peaceful coexistence. Uh, between the two. I don't know how we get back to that. Uh, I don't think it's possible to get back to that with this current leadership. I don't think it's possible to get back to it as long as North Korea has nuclear weapons. Uh, but I think that's been, the, that's been the real challenge. At the end of the day, the Chinese are not delusional. The Chinese know that North Korea is on its way out. Whether it's going to be 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 years, another century, who knows. But and so they, they've got to start sort of preparing. The thing that I find somewhat disconcerting, uh, to, be very, to be very blunt, is when I tell the Chinese, you know, you guys, I thought you were good at long-term thinking, but you're really upsetting the South Koreans in the long term. And if you understand that the South Koreans are the winners, uh, by backing the North the way you're doing, you're really upsetting the South Koreans. Uh, don't you think about that? And the Chinese response to that, quite frankly and quite bluntly, is we don't care if the South Koreans like us or not. We're the big kid on the block now. They're going to have to do what we want. And so this is uh, my lecture to the Chinese, and this is bad coming from an American. I'm taking the US policies in Asia class uh, here at the university. Yeah. Uh, my question has to do more with uh, some countries that weren't quite mentioned by name uh, during your discussion. And that is uh, more along the lines of Cambodia and Thailand. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you saw an end to the Hun Sen government in Cambodia. And uh, what was, the, and another question would be, what is the main U.S. interest in Cambodia and Thailand? I guess you could say as well, since they're both interconnected. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the U.S. policy on Cambodia for a number of years now has been uh, pretended that it isn't there. Uh, you know, we, we are now finally, I think, starting to have some interaction with, with the Cambodians in the humanitarian assistance disaster relief area, uh, some discussions with them. Uh, you know, in my view, Hun Sen is an evil man, uh, but he's their evil man, and you've got to deal with the person that you've got there, and, and they don't seem to have any solution to, to get rid of him. Uh, I think that we have to be very careful in how we go about it. Uh, again, uh, an, an anecdote. Uh, about six months ago, I was in Bangkok trying to set up an alliances meeting that we're going to be doing. We're having people from the Philippines flying in here in about two weeks to Bangkok, and we're doing a U.S.-Philippine tie. Uh, how do we sort of maximize the benefits of these two uh, alliances and, and cooperate more? Uh, I met with the head of the National Defense University, a, a Thai three-star general. It's supposed to be a sort of a 15-minute courtesy call, hello, how are you, gee, we're glad you're doing this, thank you very much, general salute, and you, you walk out. He grilled me for 30 minutes on what is the U.S. doing in Southeast Asia, why are you helping the Cambodians when they're putting forces on our border and trying to claim our, our territory and, and have uh, Toxin now as, as their advisor, he's now, I guess, left, but at, at the time was, uh, was doing that, the former prime minister from Thailand. And what's going on with Burma? You, your Secretary of State is saying they're developing nuclear weapons and no one's sharing that with us and we're an ally. So priorities. Uh, I was in, again, in the Philippines uh, when President Obama announced that he had to delay once again his trip to Indonesia. And everyone was writing in the US, ASEAN is upset about Obama snubbing, uh, you know, uh, Southeast Asia. So I asked the Filipinos, I said, you know, well, how upset are you by this? And, and the response, and again, whether it's typical or not, was, we could care less if he goes to Indonesia. He's our ally. He ought to be coming to the Philippines. When's he coming here? 
So we seem to think of ASEAN you know, as if it's one group, but you know, we have two security allies in ASEAN, Thailand and the Philippines. Uh, sometimes they don't feel like we've remembered that they're our security allies that we've had alliances with for a long time. So I tell my friends, beware the lure of Singapore. Everybody wants to do things in Singapore because, A, it's the only place in Southeast Asia you can drink the water. The trains run on time. It's, you know, everything is efficient and all of that. But if you want to know what's happening in, in Southeast Asia, you don't go to Singapore and talk with them because most Southeast Asians don't fully trust the Singaporeans because they're more Chinese than they are Southeast Asian. Again, I'm, my own personal view, and this is certainly not an official uh, view of anybody, so you really got to sort of pay attention. I, I think we need to be doing more with Thailand and we, or with Cambodia, and we need to sort of, there are, again, some of the young people we have coming in to our young leaders from Cambodia are very bright. Uh, but we've got to sort of remember the Thais and remember the Philippines and, and remember Indonesia. We, we put a lot of support into supporting Indonesian democracy. Now that it's there, uh, we need to pay a little bit more attention to them, uh, but we've got to sort of spread that attention out. I hope that got to your, your question. I probably rambled on a little bit one more. too much. Yeah, sure. All right, one more. Last question. My name is Jason Harrison. I'm an uh, international relations major here at BYU, and I just wanted to ask you about your perspective. Um, you mentioned as one of the trends in Asia the rise of China, and I want to get your perspective on the rise of India, mm -hmm. and if you think that over the next 20, 30 years, who will really become the greater um, economic power? Okay. So. Good, uh, a good question. I mean, I've, I've described India as a country with great potential that will always have great potential. You know, we, uh, and 20 years ago, India had great potential. 20 years from now, it will still have great potential. Uh, but somehow or other, it seems to never quite fully get its act together. Uh, I, uh, India has a, a serious population problem. Uh, the Chinese are now going to suffer the opposite side of that. You know, the, the one-child policy has helped China to get richer quicker, uh, but it also is going to help it get older before it gets really rich uh, and run into problems with, with next generation things. The Indians, on the other hand, somehow or other seem to think if, if we had more people than China, that makes us better than China. So they seem to want to see how many people they can have as, as quickly as possible, but it's dragging them down. So I'm... I, I think that there are, that the Chinese, uh, I don't foresee, I'm not part of the group that says China's going to surpass the United States in the next 10 years or 20 years or something because you can have 10% growth when you have a trillion dollar economy, but if you had a $10 trillion economy and you tried to have 10% growth, you would disintegrate and you'd be trying to slow it down. So all of these straight line arrows and all of that, the world doesn't work that way and I don't, I don't by that at all. I'm also a political scientist, not an economist, so I automatically dismiss things I don't understand, and economics is, <laughs> economics is one of them. But, uh, but I, just, I, I just don't see how that, that kind of a trend can continue. I, I think that 10 years from now, everyone is going to be saying, oh, wow, but the country they're going to be looking at is going to be Vietnam, not China, not India. Uh, and the reason why, again, this is my own political theory, is that Vietnam needs about three more dinosaurs to die. They've got a couple more of these old guys that are still sort of from the old revolution who are sort of trying to keep them pure while the 20-somethings and the 30-somethings in Vietnam all have degrees from the Fletcher School and from Oxford and from everywhere else. And as soon as you set these guys loose, whew, watch out. Uh, they're ready to fly. They're going to really be moving. And if we want to really pay attention to what's happening in, in Southeast Asia, we need to focus on Indonesia, we need to focus on our democratic allies in the Philippines and Thailand, and we need to particularly focus on Vietnam. And I think one thing that I will give both the Bush and the Obama administration credit on is that they have gone a great way in putting our history behind us, the Vietnam War, and, and working with Vietnam, and that's going to be, I think, the real success story in the, in the next 10 to 20 years. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.
Thank you, Jim. I think after that wonderful talk and Q&A session, you realize why so many Asians believe that uh, the United States' outstanding Asian expert is indeed Ralph Kassa. We have Chinese experts on China and experts on Japan and experts on the various countries, but uh, for an overall and comprehensive assessment of what's going on in Asia, uh, these people, perhaps more in uh, Asia than in the United States, uh, turn to Ralph Kassa as the most informed and most authoritative voice about uh, Asia and its uh, importance to the United States. His work at CSCAP and the Pacific Forum will undoubtedly continue and we can look forward to uh, having Ralph back again to inform us and inspire us to uh, uh, gain a greater understanding of what's happening in Asia as a whole. So we're grateful to you very much, Ralph, for that. I just want to thank uh, Ralph again for that uh, wonderful presentation. Thank all of you for coming. You have an interesting couple of days ahead of you. and. Uh, We'll bid you a farewell then, and we'll be, be back here uh, tomorrow evening. You'll know you have your instructions, your maps. If any of you have any questions, please talk to Emily. Would you stand up? Or Anna Laura uh, or uh, Scott, and they can answer any of your questions. Make sure you get where you need to be tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. <laughs>